I want to thank uh, Dr. Odensky for really, <laughs> we always say this, but a really gracious introduction. But not only that, I think framing it at the beginning about this question of loss, which is not exactly what the topic is. There are a lot of people who write about trauma, post-Holocaust memory, second gen, second gen and third generation issues. But as educators, you um, have the difficult task of trying to help people understand what happened, why it happened, where it happened, and what was lost. And it's, um, it's extremely challenging. So I, I very much appreciate um, Dr. Odensky's introduction. So I'm going to begin today with some actual audio tape, but before we get to that, we're going, I'm going to give you a little bit of background and then I'll move to a PowerPoint. And because we're in Zoom land, please forgive me if there's any kind of glitches with, um, with what happened. So you'll just give me, someone will just say to me, you can't hear well or you can't see well and I'll adjust it. So um, today's topic is Lucy S. Davidovich and the rescue of Jewish cultural property during and after World War II. So let me um, see if I can start with my PowerPoint. So I need, again, the affirmation that you can see it. Yes, okay, great. So that's where we are. Lucia Stavidovich and the rescue of Jewish cultural property during and after World War II. So I'm going to start with a few short segments from the Jewish Theological Seminary's faith-based broadcasting program, The Eternal Light from April, 1960. Now, The Eternal Light, for those of you who don't know, was founded in October of 1944 in cooperation with NBC as part of a rubric of public service programming for religious groups, itself part of what we might today call the Cultural Cold War. And I can nod to that a little bit later if you're interested. The Eternal Light presented original radio dramas and offered post-war American Jews spiritual guidance through the medium of radio. The show explained Judaism's basic concepts, retold biblical and Talmudic stories, and recounted pivotal events in Jewish history. Louis Finkelstein, then chancellor of JTS, was extremely enthusiastic about the eternal light, and all told, there were 800 episodes. On April 24th, 1960, the episode, The Golden Chain, aired. Which, reca which recounted the dramatic story of the YIVO Institute's successful rescue of library, archival, and material culture from Vilna, Poland that had been plundered by the Nazis during World War II. The, the materials were actually rescued from, quote unquote, rescued from Germany, but they had originated in uh, Eastern Europe, in Poland. YIVO, again, for those of you who may be unfamiliar, is the acronym for the Yiddish Wissenschaftliche Institute, then called the Yiddish Scientific Institute, and now called the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research, which was conceptually founded in Berlin in 1924 and established in Vilna, Poland in 1925. The episode of the Golden Chain that we're going to listen to was written by uh, Yehuda Stamfer, and the script was approved by Max Weinreich, who's the director of the YIVO in New York and had been associated as the director of the YIVO in Vilna. The main actors in the radio script whom you'll hear from, because you're not listening to the whole thing, are Steve and Jerry, who are two moving men, Naftali Feinerman, the executive secretary of the YIVO, Zelig Kalmanovich, a YIVO activist, a linguist and translator, an extremely important figure who perished in the Holocaust, Avram Sutzkever, a Vilna-based Yiddish activist, poet, and partisan who was key to the Papier Brigade, the Paper Brigade, the ghetto laborers, the slave laborers in the Vilna ghetto who did their best to protect Jewish cultural property in the ghetto itself. Um, and Sutzkever survived um, actually in the Soviet Union. Again, an incredibly interesting story. Uh, Sigmund Gotthard, the SS advisor to Heinrich Himmler, Seymour Pomerantz, the library of, uh, librarian of Congress and a YIVO activist, Professor Saul Lipskin, secretary of YIVO's academic council, and Frank Peters. 
You will not meet Lucy Schildkret in this episode. Lucy Schildkret is the maiden name of Lucy Davidovich, whose story, as, she will, as we will see, was not included in the broadcast, even though she was the one who tirelessly cataloged the 162,683 Yiddish and Hebrew volumes, identifying 32,894 of them, which were included with the 420 boxes that were shipped to New York in June of 1947. So now sit back and enjoy the show. I'm going to stop sharing this so I can start sharing the, um, the radio broadcast and please let me know that you can hear it, that um, I'm starting now at minute 105. Start a little bit earlier, but make, please reassure me someone with the thumb. The was written by Judah Stamper. Jerry, 1048 Fifth Avenue. Let's get those cartons unloaded. This is a lot of merchandise, Steve, if it's for a store. Evil. It is Scientific Institute. <laughs> Some kind of library, I guess. Well, let's get to work and start unloading. So with the delivery of 420 cartons of books and papers, there ends a seven-year struggle for the rescue of the largest collection of Judaica in Hitler Europe, the Vilna Collection of the Yiddish Scientific Institute. And so ends a journey that was a kind of resurrection, not of human beings, but of the spirit that animated them through the centuries. A journey begun back in 1940, just after the Soviets and Nazis partitioned Poland. The Second World War was getting underway, and the earth of Poland smelled of disaster like a hot Kansas cornfield just before the tornado strikes. Saley. Hmm? Saley Kalmanovich. Don't you recognize me? But of course, Naftali Feynman. Yes. So Jews still find their way to the Jerusalem of Lithuania in an unsettled hour. Unsettled to say the least. In America, we've been desperately worried. Uh, Nancy, we're not hearing anything. Remove every child, every wagon, now? the very bodies from their graves. But at least whatever happens, let our history not be blotted out. I can't I'm hear you now. How my spirits sway these days. Yeah, maybe you could just go back a little bit. We we heard up to the point where they said that we in America are really worried. So maybe we could go back, go back to that point. Desperately worried. Yeah. Thank you. What should a Jew be worried? Your old hands at weathering misfortunes. Ah, to such misfortunes may God deflect them. I don't know if we are too experienced. It is in our power to do only so much as for the rest. But what brings you to Vilna? I came in the name of the American evil. Uh, dear brothers, they can hardly pluck us from between the hammer and the bear. It is for the library and the archive we're concerned. Yes. 100,000 volumes, first editions, manuscripts, town laws, responsum. So, the American Yevo is thinking of our library in dark. Oh, would God we could remove every child, every wagon driver, the very bodies from their graves. But at least whatever happens, let our history not be plotted out. Naftali, how my spirits sway these days. You are right. The archive survived. I would find my own death lighter. How long would their assembly and grating take? Five weeks, maybe four, if we hurry. In that time, I'll try to arrange the papers we need. We will all have to hurry. I am sure our advisory council would agree. 
As you say, we have no time to waste. Naftali Heinemann to Evo, New York. Will the Evo give permission for removal of archives? Urge immediate contact, State Department. Urgent, there be no delay. Urgent. So note a couple of things here already as we go forward. There's an American Evo, there's a Vilna Evo. Naftali Feinerman is writing a memo that involves the State Department. So we have to think about the context of the American context. This is now supposedly before the war, but now we're gonna move to the years of the ghetto. So 1941, and we're gonna hear a conversation between Kalmanovich and Avon Sutskever. So here we go. It's good to know there is peace in Israel. Are you out of your mind? What peace is there in Israel? For years now, Abraham Suskava, whenever you get impatient with me, I am Chava Kolmanovich. When you are at peace with me, I become Zalik again. You just call me Zalik. So I know there is peace in Israel. So let there be peace in Israel, but where will we celebrate it? I hear a wooden wall has been erected around several square blocks in the workers' quarter, like a ghetto. I guess that's where we're being transported. And completely cut off from the Euro library. Yes, for the time being. Say, Lee, for a social scientist, you have the soul of a mystic. I may be a social scientist, Abraham, but I happen to believe society is sacred. You know, in a footnote, one of our 14th century manuscripts is recorded. First. Stop! Stop! The name of the SS. Oh. I require someone familiar with the Evo library and archives. Quiet, don't trust them. That's the difference. You will find me soon enough. I might be able to help the officer. Who are you? Zelik Galvanovich, curator of the Evo Vilna archives. Dr. Sigmund Gotthard, advisor to Heinrich Himmel on Jewish questions. You will take me to your archives building immediately. Get into my car. Do that. All right. So, these are your books, your records. Good. Excellent. Just what I have been looking for. What is it you want with our archives? We have no munitions. Who needs your munitions? It's your soul, be one. That is my act, to capture the Jewish soul. And we have it here, in these rooms. What can you do with our soul, Dr. Gotthard, that you cannot do with your own? Study it, analyze it, document it. Long after we burn your memories from German soil, your degenerate records in our museums will vindicate our policy. What are these? Original manuscripts of Shulam and Eichem, Newt Lamet Peretz, two of our most distinguished writers. <laughs> How helpless they are in my Aryan hands. I hurled them to the ground. I trampled them underfoot. You have a powerful foot, Dr. Gotthard. And enough. Enough. These archives will be seek up until sent for. In this room, we have the mummified Jewish soul in thousands upon thousands of books and manuscripts. And the last section you're going to hear is after the liberation of Vilna by the Soviets on July 13, 1944. Listen very carefully in the conversation between Seymour Pomerantza and, um, and uh, um, it's not coming over to uh, um, someone at the OAD about the question of territorial claims. Territorial claims, as we'll see, this is a fundamental stumbling block for the EVO's efforts to get its materials. The question of returning 
property to the territory in which it was written. So let's listen now to this. And this is the last section that we'll share today. Soviet army recaptured Vilna. The city was a shambles. The Jewish quarter totally obliterated and its famous Yibo Institute destroyed. Excuse me. Excuse me, sir. Yes, what is it? You are an American correspondent, aren't you? Yes, I am. What's that to you? When are you going back to the United States? Why, as a matter of fact, military transport is flying me back tomorrow. Well, what's that to you? Who are you? Oh. Never mind my name. I, I have a package I want you to deliver to the office of the American Evo in New York. Deliver a package? It, it contains a book. Open it and see for yourself. A book? Yes. The latest book printed by the Vilna Euro before the presses were destroyed. I preserved it fighting for the partisans. I want it brought to America. Why not keep it here in Vilna? The city has been liberated. This is a graveyard that has been recaptured. A graveyard that once contained a soul. That soul must rejoin a living community, not remain to be buried in a dead one. Oh, I see. Let me see this book. Here, sir. On the Psychology of Education, Vilna Evil, 1940. Oh, it's like instructions from the dead on how to bring up the next generation. All right, I will take it for you. So the last book of Bill Naturi, treasured in a single volume, finally reached a Jewish community. After four years, the golden chain was reestablished. And after five years, as the Allied armies advanced, they were alerted to be on the lookout for books and archives in the tens of thousands. On July 24th, 1945, the following message was sent. Yiddish Scientific Institute, New York. In answer to your inquiry, a large cache of Judaic material estimated to number in the tens of thousands of volumes has been found in a pit near Frankfurt. More in the cellar of the Nazi Institute for Jewish Knowledge in Frankfurt. How does the situation stand, Saul? <sighs> Ticklish, Max. Those are the Vilna archives. And the State Department is backing our claim. But the Army wants to return all cultural treasures to their territorial origin. Did our dead colleagues pass the very soul of their community through a wall of fire, only to have it held back by a wall of red tape? No. No, sir. This will fight. So for two years, YIVO carried its claim from agency to department, from department to board, from board to committee, from committee to conference. Until finally, in June 1947. Dr. Frank Peters. Yes? I'm Captain Seymour Pomerantz of the YIVO, the Yiddish Scientific Institute. Oh, yes, yes. What can I do for you? I understand the Library of Congress is sending a representative to bring back American cultural treasures. That is correct. The YIVO also has a cache of archives there. Yes, but uh, haven't territorial claims been put upon them? Well, sir, those claims would wipe out every trace of meaning in the deaths of those who died to preserve them. We Jews are a unique people. The chain of our tradition is not embedded in the soil of Poland or Lithuania, but in our history. I fully appreciate the unique character of your history, Captain Pomerantz, but how can I help you? Well, Dr. Peters, American headquarters has recognized our legal claim to this treasure. We are an American organization. These are within the scope of your mission, like those treasures you're going to Europe to bring back. I see. Cut through the red tape, Dr. Peters. Bring them back as part of your mission. You will have my every cooperation. Thank you, sir. Let it be with all possible speed. We will know how to treasure that legacy. Your authorization will be made out immediately. Easy does it, Jerry. That's the last of those cartons. Well, help me set it down, Steve. I'm pushed. Okay, boy. Yeah, that was some load. Well, let's hope these books are going to stay put for a while. <laughs> okay. 
So I hope even though it was cut up a little bit, you got a sense of some of the themes that um, are part of the whole question of cultural re uh, restitution um, and particularly with Jewish cultural property. The issue is about uh, America's power, particularly in post-war, uh, the relationship of the New York Yivo to the Vilna Yivo, the whole question of how Jews could make a claim for themselves when they did not have a sovereign territory. Um, the other issue that you didn't hear about, but we'll see as I discuss uh, Lucius, uh, Lucy Shilkert's role, is the, comp the competition among Jewish organizations in Europe and in Palestine for these Jewish cultural records. Because the question looming in the immediate aftermath of the war, and even during the war, by the way, was who gets to speak, which institutions get to speak on behalf of the Jewish people? which gets to a very, very, very profound question. Are Jews going to continue living as a diasporic people or are Jews going to live in what was then mandatory Palestine, mandatory Palestine with the aspiration of have, having state sovereignty and what will then become the modern state of Israel? These are profound questions. They actually continue to this day, but they were particularly fraught, contested, um, uh, ideologically uh, burning during uh, during World War II, and then with the knowledge of what happened uh, during the Horban or the Holocaust. So I'm now going to focus on Lucy Schildkret and her role, but I hope you'll see that her role illuminates some of these more uh, larger meta questions. And of course, I look forward to your questions as we proceed. So. Um, who was she? Who was Lucy S. Davidovich? So again, I'm going to now share my screen and show you some images. Um, yeah, let's see. I hope this works. Yeah, good. There we go, right? Okay. Who was she? Lucy Schildkart was born in 1915 in New York City to a Polish Jewish immigrant family. She was in many ways typical of a second generation immigrant daughter. Her father came from Warsaw, her mother came from outside of Warsaw, and they arrived in the United States before World War I in the revolutionary year 1905. She was raised in the Bronx, educated in New York City public schools, and she attended the prestigious Hunter High School for Girls as well as its selective college. These were single sex public institutions. She was, however, different than many immigrant children in that her parents were Yiddishists and they educated her in institutions that were associated with the movement called diaspora nationalism. Diaspora nationalists believed that the Jewish people, the nation, preceded Judaism, the religion, and that the former, the collective identity of this nation, guaranteed the latter through its autonomous communal institutions. That is, Jewish communal institutions in their long history have sustained the Jewish people and given them spiritual, cultural, and moral authority. That is what diaspora nationalists believed. And, and there were many different kinds of diaspora, diaspora nationalists. Some were politically um, associated with, with uh, left-wing political parties. Others weren't. Her parents were not. They uh, sent her to diaspora nationalist schools that were nonpartisan politically. And this was through a institution called the Sholem Alechem Folk Institute named for the great Yiddish writer. And she was very, very active in the Sholem Alechem Folk Institute. This meant that after school, after public school, twice a week and then on the weekends, she went to Yiddish school. And this was, this was not typical of most immigrants, but it was typical of the devoted minority who cared about Yiddish culture. And there were actually four Yiddish school movements in New York in the interwar period. She was interested in writing and editing. Um, so not only at Hunter College was she editor of her literary magazine, but she also was editor of Schlift, which was the literary magazine of the Sholem Aleichem uh, Jugendgesellschaft, the, the uh, youth movement. And um, she was devoted then to Yiddish education, Yiddishism, the future, the diasporic uh, future of the Jews with the Yiddish language, as well as the simultaneously, she's acculturating to American society. She majors in English, she goes to Hunter College. 
Um, so she has a kind of, I wouldn't say a bifurcated, bifurcated identity, but a rather integrated ident identity as an immigrant Jew. Well, all those things are wonderful, but when she graduated with an English degree in 1936, she was marginally um, employed. It was very hard to get uh, work in those years. The effects of the depression were still real. Many, many girls who went, I can call them more young women who went to Hunter became school teachers. Lucy actually failed the test based on her accent and she was not alone. There was um, subtle or not so subtle forms of anti-Jewish uh, hatred or anti-Semitism in the school system. And she did not successfully pass her teacher's exam, which by the way, was probably a good idea. I don't think she would have been a very good teacher for young children. Um, so she decided to kind of pursue a graduate career. She applied to Colombian English literature and she was accepted, but she came to the conclusion that Keats and Wordsworth were no longer interesting to her. She tells us that in her memoir. Simultaneous with going to graduate school in English, which was short-lived, she devoted herself to learning more about Yiddish culture, and she spent an enormous amount of time at the New York City Public Library's DeRote Division, still a great place to spend time, researching the Yiddish press in England. One of her teachers at the Sholem Aleichem Folk Institute was Yaakov Shatsky, extremely important Polish Jewish historian who had immigrated to the United States. And Shotsky urged her to go to Vilna, Poland, to participate in a program called the Asperam Tour, which was a graduate fellowship program at the Vilna Yivo. And so she did this. And in 1938, Lucy Schildkret sailed to Poland. And here we see the um, Jewish Daily Forward, the Fallwelts, publishing an article about her with her Hunter College uh, graduation picture on the left. And the picture on the right is of the fellow Aspiranten. Those are the students in the graduate program as well as her teachers. And here's um, another example of uh, her year there as an Aspirant. We have here the list of the cohort, the fourth cohort of the Aspiranten. And you see the red arrow. I did my best to show you it at the bottom. And it says in Yiddish, reading from right to left, um, Liebe Schildkret, New York, Yiddische Presse in England. This was her thesis topic that she uh, researched while she was at the Vilna Yivo. So in these years, and again, to underscore what um, Dr. Radensky said, she is immersed in what we now know was the before. She did not know it was the before. She just knew she was in a multicultural lit, um, Polish city that actually was the had been the capital of Lithuania, that's a different story, with a, a big population of Jews, a big population of Poles, a big population of Russians which was the heart of Jewish secular life because of the Yivo, but also had a legendary rabbinic tradition. And that is the world that she inhabited. She did not interact very much with uh, the Gentile populations. And in fact, she also experienced on the street anti-Semitism among the university students. That also shaped her. And that's again, another part of her biography. She also got to know the luminaries associated with the Vilna Yivo, including Zelik Kalmanovich and his wife Rivola, who became surrogate parents to her. She met Avram Sutzkever, whose name you heard in the audio, as well as the great Yiddish uh, writer Chaim Grade. Just today, someone sent me digital materials from correspondence between Chaim Grade and Lucy Davidovich in the new Chaim Grade digital collections. We can talk about that as well. And she was fairly content. I mean, she missed the States a little bit, but she was fairly content. She was certainly aware of the drumbeats of war, but it's important to realize that even in Poland in 1938, there was no top-down governmental legal disenfranchisement of the Jews. There was bottom-up anti-Semitism. There was hostility in the streets. There, was, there were threats against Jews and threats to proscribe, for example, kosher slaughter. But the situation in Nazi Germany after 
Hitler's chancellorship in 1933 and the slow and steady rescission of Jewish rights did not happen in Poland, okay? So there's social uh, problems, but there isn't legal. So the reason I, I emphasize this is not only because I care about history in all its accuracy, is that when we ask ourselves, why did she go? Why did she stay? We have to understand that from a legal perspective, there, was, there wasn't a problem with her going to Poland. But as we know, in August of 1939, Hitler and Stalin signed a pact, a, um, a, a pact of non-aggression, and this meant that war was going to uh, was going to occur it, without the Red Army to defend um, anything or defend itself. Um, it was clear that the Wehrmacht and later, of course, the SS had overwhelming power. And American nationals in Poland received notifications that they should leave, that indeed the war, uh, that there would be war. So sadly, very tragically for her, what she felt emotionally completely torn up, she took a train from Vilna to Warsaw to Berlin and then to Copenhagen, which was the only place where uh, she could get a, any kind of civilian ticket back to the United States. And by the time she lands in the United States in September, the war has already started. Germany has invaded Poland. The Soviets have invaded for, from the east. And Poland is, for all intents and purposes, repartitioned. Now, Max Weinreich, the director of the YIVO, also was in Copenhagen. And that was just serendipitous. Weinreich had been on his way to a linguistics conference in Brussels. The war broke out. Vilna was under Soviet occupation, but Weinreich made his way to Copenhagen with one of his sons. And through a series of um, you know, great efforts, he was able to get his other son and his wife out of Vilna. Again, from 1939 to 1941, there was movement um, in and out of occupied uh, Soviet Poland, right? Or Soviet occupied Poland. Jews could get to Vilna, take the Trans-Siberian and, and get out. It wasn't simple, but it was unlike the situation for most Jews in German-occupied Poland. Weinreich was already concerned about what was going to happen to the Vilna Yivo. And um, in the 1920s, there had already been simultaneous with the establishment of the Vilna Yivo, the establishment of an American branch what was known as the Americana Uptail or the Amoptail. This branch was really a shadow or just a tendril of the great Yivo in Vilna, but it was faithful that it existed because it is based on the American Uptail that Weinreich, when he arrives in the United States, is going to make, uh, make an argument that the American Yivo is more in, is essential to the YIVO's international uh, operation, if you will, and that after the wars, we'll see, it will be the successor organization of the Vilna YIVO. This is going to allow Weinreich to make legal claims for the archival and library materials that end up being plundered. So that this establishment of the American YIVO in the 20s, even though it's really a shadow of, of the Vilna Yivo, is extremely important. And Weinreich is extremely savvy. One could say he's heroic. There are a lot of different things we could say, but when he arrives in the United States, he immediately bolstered, if you will, the institutional claims about the American uptail, about the uptail. Um, okay, I'm sorry, I missed showing you this. This is Pri, this is Lucy um, and her fellow Asperantin. Um, at the, at the uh, Vilna Yivo. Now, some of you know, and again, Dr. Radensky uh, mentioned it and the audio tape mentioned it too, the Nazis not only decided to destroy the Jewish people, the human beings, but they also in what can only call an uncanny commitment to their sense of Wissenschaft, wanted to go through and call the Judaica libraries in Europe for the best materials of Jewish civilization. They wanted to create a museum of the extinct race. They wanted evidence of this, uh, of, of this community that they viewed as a poison in European society. And they wanted to prove 
what was in you know Judaica uh, that either was dangerous or you know other, and so they employed scores of experts to go through the European libraries to plunder, loot, and save materials. And this was under the auspices of um, the Einsatzstab Reichsleiter Rosenberg, the Reich Leader Rosenberg Task Force, the ERR, which is established as early as 1940. By 1942, there were offices, there were offices throughout Europe, and the ERR proceeded to loot the cultural treasures and spreading the net of this plunder to include 365 archives, 957 libraries, 531 research and educational institutes, and 402 museums in Eastern Europe alone. At Rosenberg's side in the plunder of Judaica was someone named Dr. Johannes Paul, who was an expert in Hebrew literature. He was dedicated to the concept of Judenforschung ohne Juden, Jewish research or Jewish studies without Jews. And he oversaw the collection and shipment of Vilna's valuable Judaica to Rosenberg's Institut zur Erforschung der Judenfrage, the Institute for Research on the Jewish Question, which was located in Frankfurt. Weinreich is acutely aware of these issues and about protecting Yivo's property. Remember, until 1941, he can communicate with the Vilna Yivo. While the Soviets control Vilna, there are still channels of communication. And we have correspondence between figures like Zosha Tchaikovsky and Elias and Riva Cherikova, for example, over the fate of the archive of Yivo's historical section, which had been based in Paris since 1933. And in 1942, Weinreich writes to Green H. Hackworth, a legal advisor in the State Department's Division of Cultural Relations, to put on record with the US government that the German occupying forces have, quote, carried away everything from the building of the Yivo Scientific Institute at 18 Wilwolski Street. And he is anticipating future restitution claims. We now know that everything was not carried away when the Nazis broke the pact with the Soviets. Some of you may know that the Evo Institute has been digitizing and says that it has finished this project of digitizing other materials that were found in Lithuania in the last 10 years. The Grata collection, which I mentioned, is a different set of issues. But the Evo Today in New York is actively involved with digitization. Liba or Lucy Shilkrit's efforts on behalf of Evo, Evo's materials after the war came out of her natural engagement in the pre-war years with the Evo, her working with Max Weinreich as his secretary during the war years at the New York Evo, and her commitment to people like Almanovich who had perished. So she is living in New York during the war years, and she and the other refugee scholars at the New York Giver are watching the horror unfold in Europe. And she was Max von Reich's secretary. So she's privy to all of his negotiations, all of his telegrams, all of his letters to the State Department, to other libraries, the Library of Congress, to other um, activists in cultural restitution. And in 1946, he had taken the leave, Max von Reich had taken the leave from the Yivo to write a very important book called Hitler's Professors, the part of scholarship in Germany's crimes against the Jewish people. And she worked on her own. Now, in 1945, a cable came from someone named Captain Abraham Aharoni, who was a Yivo activist to his wife, Celia, in New York. And a month later, General Lucius Clay, who was commander of the US forces in Germany, informed the US War Department of a discovery of books with YIVO's book stamp, it's ex libris, um, in uh, two big caches. One was in Frankfurt itself, and another was a cave in Hungen. As soon as Weinreich got this news that the possibility that there were materials from YIVO, including uh, uh, materials from Vilna, including uh, YIVO's own library, he set out to assert the Institute's claims. And again, I want to underscore here, he's going to do this now as an American citizen. He's going to do this with the power of the American government and the American army. Um, so this is 
why he's going to be able to do this. Remember, I intimated that there are lots of other people in the post-war years, lots of other Jewish organizations who want to make a claim for these materials. So there is in some ways a race, if you will, to salvage or rescue these materials. But because there's a race, that means there's a competition between worldviews, between resources, between staff, about who can successfully make a claim for the restitution of Jewish cultural property. It is a very thorny issue. And um, as we will see, post-war Jewry, particularly post-war Polish Jewry, um, had a very difficult uh, problem because it couldn't make a territorial claim. The Jews were diasporic people. And post-war Polish Jewry had an even bigger problem because except for the Jews of Thessalonica, the Polish, Jew, Polish Jewry suffered the most. 90% of, of Jews of Poland were murdered during the Chorban, during the Holocaust. So who, where were the survivors who could make a claim about their books, right? Where were the institutions? Warsaw had been leveled. Vilna had been leveled, right? Any place that was in, in between the Soviet and German, the Soviet army and the, and the allied forces and the Germans was rubbles. Some of you have seen pictures of it. And international law said that the materials had to go back to the territory in which they had been created or to a successor organization. And that's where the American Evo um, is going to be involved. So there are two huge problems. One is the territorial claim, and the other is the issue of airless property, right? It's one thing if you have books, cultural art. Some of you may know about the efforts to restitute art. If you can prove provenance and ownership about a piece of art that's been plundered or stolen or sold through um, unscrupulous dealers, even today, pieces of art are getting restituted, right? We know this, and it, it continues to happen. But what happens if the materials are airless, that there are no heirs? So this, again, is where the successor um, institution um, comes into play. Um, at the Offenbach Archival Depot, which is where all of the materials ended up, and this is in the American zone of occupied Germany, there were over 3 million looted items, thousands of which came from Poland, and many, many uh, hundreds that could be considered part of uh, the original uh, Vilna collections, collections from Vilna, excuse me, and the Yivo itself. Weinreich was dogged. He pursued the tactics of insisting that the, the materials of Vilna were belong to what he called the Vilna collection of the YIVO, and that all the that YIVO was the successor organization to the Vilna YIVO. So he pursued two tactics, and he did it from 1945 to 1947. Phil, he wrote to everyone. He went to DC over and over again. We have telegrams, we have letters, et cetera, and include all kinds of people, the Library of Congress, the Division of Economic Security, Rabbi Judah Nadich, some of you know, was the advisor to Jewish affairs to Dwight Eisenhower. He was deployed, YIVO activists who were soldiers, whole cadre of people. And he planned to go to Frankfurt to supervise the transfer of the documents, but he never made the trip. Instead, Lucy Schildkraut, right, our, our young woman, she, who was the link between the Vilna YIVO before the war and the American YIVO, ultimately acted in his stead. In 1946, she decided to return to Europe and she was hired by the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee to work as an educational officer in the displaced person camps. And you've learned about this with my wonderful, extremely talented, gifted historian colleague, Avi Pat, how lucky for you about the, the DP camps. What you need to realize, I think you know, is that there were DP camps in the American zone, there were DP camps in the British zone, there were DP camps in Italy. So each uh, national context is different. She worked primarily, but not exclusively when it came to the restitution of Jewish property in the American zone. She was charged with going through the Offenbach Archival Depot's collections to get books and other materials that the DP schools could use, right? These were not necessarily valuable materials. These were second and third run textbooks, for example, but the DP schools needed it. And she was instrumental in going through those materials, seeing which books could be used, 
and dealing with the uh, people in the JDC, the Joint Distribution Committee, as well as the leadership in the OAD. And this is just a picture uh, to give you a sense of you know, some of the things that she did um, on, well, my left, I think it's your left, you see a Yiddish journal called From Letson Holman. This is one of the first survivor uh, magazines. It has testimonies. It was published in Yiddish, as you can see. Extremely important, published in Munich in the American zone. And she was instrumental in helping get the Yiddish linotype for this um, um, publication. The top picture shows you with a dramatic club in Belsen. This was in the British zone at the end of her tenure working for the JDC. And at the bottom, you see her sitting with the big American Joint Distribution Committee flag. Um, what you perhaps can't see is that often she was dressed in what looks like military uniform. So um, JDC workers were part of, they were part of an American international welfare organization, a Jewish organization, but they had to operate within the confines of the American military. So they are part of this American quote, post-war occupying force. She arrived at the Offenbach Archival Depot in February 1947. She was the official represent, uh, representative, as I said. Her main task at the beginning was getting the books for the DPs. But soon it became clear that she would be instrumental in cataloging the materials that belonged to the Evo or materials that were from Vilna. We have a series of cables that she wrote in February 14th to Weinreich in 1947, telling him what she's found, including some of his own writings, archival materials, and materials that belong to the legendary Strasholm Library, which was a rabbinic library that was bequeathed to the Jewish community of Vilna. Perhaps you can tell from my tone of voice, there is tension here. What is the tension? The tension is between the library that actually is Yivos and the materials that belong, that came from Vilna that weren't necessarily part of Yivos archive and libraries. But Max Weinreich felt strongly, as did Lucy Schildkrantz, that there was no future for Polish Jewry. Remember, this is 1947, right? And he was a diaspora nationalist. And he had an institute in New York, the American Uptail. And he believed that the YIVA was the rightful successor organization of Vilna materials, Vilna Judaica. And they characterized it as the Vilna collection. And this was a successful strategy. Weinreich was able to uh, convince that the claim of the American YIVO uh, um, what we, um, preceded or superseded the territorial legal issue that, Amer that the American uptail, the American evil was the legitimate successor to the collections from Vilna. Lucy was able to catalog 420 cases of materials. And in 1947, Seymour Pomerantz, who was a YIVO activist and whose voice you heard in the uh, audio tape in the Golden Chain, came to the Offenbach Archival Depot and supervised the um, physical transfer of these 40 run, 420 cases on an Amer through the American government's um, train, you know, the trains, the cargo through the American government to arrive in New York in 1947. These are the cases of the so-called Vilna collection. And Lucy was instrumental in the cataloging of this material. And Weinreich was successful um, in um, claiming that it belonged to the New York Evo. And I want to just emphasize that after this, there is another organization, extremely important organization called Jewish Cultural uh, Reconstruction Inc., which is headed by the great emigre a historian, Salo W. Baron, actually a Jew from Austrian Poland, from Galicia. His secretary was Hannah Arendt. And JCR Inc. becomes designated by the United States as being the successor organization for other materials. And Baron and Arendt are then charged with figuring out what to do with the materials that didn't get shipped at this moment. 
Simultaneous with this, by the way, Cecil Roth of the Jewish Historical Institute of uh, England is trying to figure out what should get to England. And most importantly, uh, Gershom Shalom and Hugo Bergman from the Hebrew University in Mandatory Palestine and then post-war Palestine have made their way to the Offenbach Archival Depot and to get materials for the Hebrew University. So the story of what happens to all of these materials is incredibly complicated. And there is, as I said, competition, um, there's theft. Um, uh, we know this today. Most of these materials are still where they got in 1947, 1948, Hebrew University, the Jewish Theological Seminary, the New York Evo. Um, but scholars today now at a distance, 50 years plus, are able now to kind of tell the thorny, uh, the thorny contested history that in 1947 was not being told. And I wanna underscore something that's very important, which is the temporality of the word rescue, salvage, and theft, right? Rescue, salvage, and theft. Um, salvage or resurrection or salvation, first of all, is coded religiously. And you hear this over and over again, right? That this was the resurrection of the Jewish people. So it, it, it speaks to traumatic memory after the war. Rescue implies that something belonged to someone and now it's back. And the YIVO actually, when they did write about it, said the YIVO library is back home, right? This is in English in 1951, uh, bilingual journal for Yiddish. It's also in, in Yiddish. But when you look at this and you say the YIVO, the YIVO library is back home, you should ask today, well, where is home? Home is New York. Well, who's making this claim? Again, Weinreich was making the claim, right? And the American government um, accepted it. And I think it was heroic, but that was 1947. Today, we have a different view about provenance or about the complexities of restitution. Um, this material is not going anywhere, but you might imagine there would be a contest about, well, doesn't it belong in Eastern Europe? And in fact, when the Evo found the other found out about all the other material that was in Lithuania contemporary Lithuania, the deal was struck that the Yivo would digitize it, but the originals would stay in Vilnius, right? Because times had changed. It was no longer salvage or rescue in the immediate post-war period. It was a question of not so much theft, but to whom does this material belong? And when you have a sovereign state like post-war Lithuania, particularly after 1991, independent Lithuania, the Lithuanians were not going to part with materials that they felt belonged to their cultural heritage, right? So these are huge issues and I'm happy to talk more about them. Just to circle back to Lucy Schildkret, in the immediate post-war years, there was she was given very little credit for what she did. And there's, a, I think, a host of reasons. One is, we have to say, kind of sexism. You know, she was um, a woman, she had no big identity at that point. She was still Liba Schildkret. She wasn't the Holocaust historian Lucy Davidovich. She had been Max Weinreich's secretary. She was, you know, just a working girl, if you will. Um, and the work that she did was dull and, and boring and exhausting. It was kind of a lot of work, right? It wasn't very dramatic. She wasn't in the army. She wasn't accompanying, you know, she wasn't a soldier who had found the materials. Um, so that's one reason. The other reason is that um, the Cold War has, you can't say heated up, it doesn't make sense uh, idiomatically, but had frozen down or something. And there were YIVO materials that it's press collection in Czechoslovakia. And Weinreich and others were very concerned that if they made too much of what they had gotten from Offenbach, the Offenbach Archival Depot, that they wouldn't get the press collection, which was now under uh, Soviet informed, not exactly occupied, but communist pro communist Czechoslovakia. And in fact, uh, the EVA was not successful at getting that press collection. Those materials are still there. So the Cold War politics, the geopolitics of America versus the Soviet bloc also plays into cultural rest uh, restitution issues. And I'll just tell you, this continues throughout 
the late, 19, uh, the late 20th and into the 21st century today. Uh, Dr. Radensky mentioned a book I did with my colleague Rebecca Sykes on Sarah Levy, who was a Berlin Solonier. I mentioned this not to um, you know, not, not to uh, boast about this publication, although my colleague is amazing. But the musical, uh, the musical, the archive of the Bach family was stolen by the Soviets during World War II, and it was only discovered in Kiev after 1991, and then restituted back to Berlin. So these issues of um, what was plundered during the war, who has it, state sovereignty, uh, territorial claims continue to play out. I will conclude, although I have so many other things to tell you, is that Liebe Schildkraut's role in cataloging this material had a profound effect on her because she felt, and she tells us this in her memoir, that saving the books or saving the materials was assuaged a teeny bit of her profound guilt at what could not be saved, which was the six million Jews who perished during the Holocaust. Her entire oeuvre of Holocaust historiography, which starts with the golden tradition, continues with the war against the Jews and a Holocaust reader, and then a book on historiography, the Holocaust and the historians, and then her final memoir, uh, from that place in time are all devoted to the murdered Jews of Europe. And I say this because, and again, Dr. Radensky really underscored it, for her, the war against the Jews had been successful. She was someone who felt the loss. She felt that the great civilization of Ashkenazi Jewry, which found its apex in early modern and up to modern Eastern Europe and in cities like Vilna and, and Warsaw had been extirpated, had been successfully destroyed by the Nazis. And she felt that in 1947, this material agreeing with Weinreich belonged where there was a living Jewish community that could use it. So she felt that there was nothing that would happen in post-war Europe that would merit a claim to these Jewish materials. And she also felt strongly that the story of survivors is not the story of the war against the Jews. The story of World War II and the Holocaust is the successful destruction and extirpation of East European Jewish culture. And all of her dedications, as you can see in the slide, emphasize that. So to conclude, Lucy uh, Schildkred, who becomes Lucy Davidovich in 1948 when she marries a survivor, not exactly a survivor, a Polish a, a refugee who had come in 1940, but who lost his first family in World War uh, II. In fact, in the Warsaw Ghetto, his, uh, Shimon Davidovich's daughter was a ghetto fighter. For her, the restitution of uh, the collections from Vilna under the auspices of the Yiver New York as the successor uh, organization was a claim with full and total cultural, spiritual and material justification. For her, this material belonged in the diaspora. It belonged with a diasporic Yiddish oriented institution where these materials could be read, studied and which could impart, she hoped, some of the glory, and she felt that way, the glory of Ashkenazic civilization to the next generation of East European, the descendants of East European Jewry in the United States. Thank you very much. Questions? Uh, Professor Sinkoff, thank you so much for a really fantastic presentation. And um, yeah, I think you really brought out a lot of the issues. Um, and and uh, one of our listeners were talking actually mentioned the fact that the, these issues, these questions of provenance and return, uh, you know, you, you, you really highlighted that. And also, you know, whether it's uh, rescue or salvage or theft, it's a fascinating, fascinating topic. And I know you also mentioned uh, 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 Zosha Shakovsky, who I think was very involved in these things and some of these and the, some of these matters. I just want to take a look and see. I know there's a bunch of questions here, so let me take. I have a question too, but let me see if I can read some of the questions first from uh, from the participants. Uh, was the ERR only dedicated to Jewish cultural collections or all cultural collections? I'm just going through the list. 
Um, the ERR was devoted to Jewish collections. They, of course, were, um, and again, I, you know, I feel like someone quick, you know, Google it, but then as you know, they, the Germans plundered all kinds of libraries and archives and um, cultural treasures, right? I mean, Himmler had a private collection of European art. They blew up the, the, um, the, they blew up the, uh, um, the bridges in Florence. There's a great book, I'm sure many of you know, called The Rape, uh, the Rape of Europa, and a three-hour documentary film on this, and also on the fact that the American army had a, um, you know, a monuments uh, division where American soldiers were sent to help salvage or save cultural treasures during the war itself, which is kind of amazing to think about. So, um, there were other Nazi efforts to plunder Europe, European cultural treasures, but there were specific ones to plunder Jewish cultural treasures. Yeah, th thank, thank you so much. I'm just reading through some of these. Uh, I was listening and reading at the same time. Well, uh, I, I just want to I want to make a statement and then also um, the question. So the statement is um, for people who are not familiar with the evil. I think you, you yes. mentioned it, Nancy, but I want to underscore it. That that the the Evo Institute was created, um, you know, as 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 Professor Sinkoff said, as a um, kind of as a uh, a central archive university research institute for Ashkenazi, that is to say, Eastern European Jewry. Um, uh, it, its main collections were in the Yiddish language. Uh, they had uh, zamlers, collectors that would go out and bring things. Um, uh, it was a very prestigious organization. Uh, among other people, Sigmund Freud was, I think, a member, one of the board members originally, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and um, uh, it, it was a really very important organization. Also, though, it did represent a kind of a secular perspective, right? It was a secular, modern. The, the uh, one of the terms that Professor um, Sinkoff mentions was Wissenschaft, meaning scientific. So the idea was to use scientific techniques in order to research the, the Jewish experience and Jewish history. Um, so those those things are really, really important. So I just want to make sure that that's really clear. Why, why this one organization somehow had this incredible claim on these thousands of documents um, that had belonged, uh, belonged to the organization? And this leads me actually up to my question. Can, so, I, can I just interrupt you for a second? Can I interrupt for just, I, I'll please. take a breath. You know, one of the, you know, it's a, we always think about those history, you know, who gets, who gets to write history or survive, the sur survivors, right? The YIVO was one of the few institutions, Jewish institutions that survived, partly because it had this American branch as well. And also because Weinreich really had great fortune to survive. So this connection between his directorship in Vilna and then his directorship at, uh, at the New York Evo. So that's part of what allowed the Evo to make the claim is that it survived. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, I, I think that's really important. And I would also add that he was very, very determined. I just wanna say, um, before I wanna ask my question, so we're, we're almost out of time. Is it okay if we go a few more minutes? I hope it's okay with everybody. And, it's okay and, with me. Okay. I know I, I went on. There's too much to There's a lot to talk about. It's a very, it's an extremely rich topic. Um, so we'll go a few more minutes. I hope that that's okay with people. If they have to get off, it's fine. But I do hope that as many people can stay as possible for just for another another five minutes. Um, uh, so the question is, is and, you, and you mentioned this before, so the YIVO was one institution, and you mentioned the Strassen Library. And um, I wonder if you could, if, if there's even today con conflict or, or some issue about who should own the Strassen Library, the materials that had belonged to the Strassen Library. And let me just, maybe you could tell us a little bit more what it was, just restate that, and then if you don't mind answering the question. Right. So um, the Strassen Library was, uh, uh, became kind of a Jewish public library in Vilna, but it had an extraordinary collection of rabbinic materials. Um, it was known, it was opened on the Jewish Sabbath on Saturday, which is interesting because there's, some of you may know, these are big debates in Jewish institutions. You know, should the Jewish Museum in New York be open on the Saturday, right? Because it's the Sabbath. And, but then people who don't have days off other times can't go. So these, so the Strasheim was actually opened on the Sabbath, even though it was 
uh, a, a rabbinic repository. And everyone, and, and Lucy in her memoir uh, from that place in time talks about the fact that you could go to the Strashon and you see all different types of Jews of Vilna. So the Jews of Vilna were not all religious. There were very, very secular Jews and there were very radical Jews, right? So it's a very diverse Jewish landscape. And, but people went to the library. So the Strashon had very important manuscripts and books. Weinreich knew that. And he knew that he, he made the decision. And again, you can evaluate on your own that if he could argue that the Strashun Rabbinic Library, which became like the Jewish Public Library of Vilna, there's one in Montreal, the Jewish Public Library of Montreal, right? If he could say that it, it was actually connected to YIVO and that YIVO was the successor organization for Vilna Judaica, he could make a claim that the Strashun belonged to New York. And you can imagine Gershom Shalom and others wanted parts of the Strashon at the Hebrew University. So he made the successful claim and he also made a claim that there were no heirs. There has been some um, conflict over this because partly because, and again, there's a book on it. So you can, it's, I think it's called The Lost Library by Dan Rabinowitz is very, very smart guy. Some elements of the Strashon, as well as other elements of the Vilna collections, were sold at different points by YIVO, by JTS. Libraries sometimes have to make hard decisions about selling material, sometimes to private collectors, to raise money. And this then becomes an issue, like why does a particular, collect, why does a particular library have the right to sell a collection that may not have been exactly there? So there are contestations about that. You can look at Dan Rabinowitz, his book. Um, I, I admire him, but I think one of the things that I've discussed with him, so I'm full disclaimer, is that I think it's this issue of temporality is very important. Same thing is true of Zosha Tchaikovsky, who Dr. Rodensky mentioned. We know Zosha Tchaikovsky was instrumental in getting Yivo's historical archive from Paris to New York, incredibly important. But his life ended by, he committed suicide in his apartment in New York and they found, people found all kinds of stolen, things that he'd stolen from libraries, you know, in the later part of his life. So what do we make of his legacy, right? Was he an archive hero or was he a thief? Well, he was both, right? Weinreich and Lucy and others felt that the Strashon belonged in New York for all the reasons we discussed. And the fact that certain things were sold you know, you'll have to sort of make your judgment about it. But these these are, again, complicated legal, material, economic issues. And um, today the Strashon is at the Yivo New York. And I should just say one other thing, perhaps some, many of you know, the Yivo today is part of a consortium of libraries and archives on 16th Street, um, the Center for Jewish History, with the Leo Beck, with the um, American Sephardic um, Society, and the Yeshiva University Museum. And you have a kind of center of diasporic archives and collections, which strives to mirror, compete with the kind of collections that are at the Bodleian in, um, at Oxford. And of course, the new library in Jerusalem, the National Library of Israel, which I think is now open. So this raises, again, this metaphysical question of who gets to speak for the cultural inheritance of the Jewish people. Is it Jews in the diaspora, like in New York, what the great, a great Jewish capital in the diaspora? Or should it be the modern state of Israel with its own ideology about state sovereignty and the ingathering and the ending of the diaspora for the creation of a modern state, where which will be you know, the Jewish, in the, in the ancestral Jewish homeland. And all I can tell you is these arguments are alive and well, alive and well, alive and well, because archival collections get sold. You know, the great, the great Hebrew poet, Yehuda Michai, you can find his archives at the Beinecke Library at Yale, right? They're not in Jerusalem, where he lived his entire life. So these are these are really complicated questions. And I guess what I would say is the um, archival effort to be totalizing 
is a fiction. And, um, but libraries try to be totalizing. They wanna to be completist. They wanna get everything. But those of us who work in archives know we can always find things. The stuff turns up in places you don't expect all the time. Wow. Uh, Professor Sinkoff, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. I think it was really fascinating. And I know we, there's still a couple of questions here that, that we have, but um, um, if, if somebody has a question, may I, may I forward it to you? Sure. Okay, thank you. And um, I wanna thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, I, I, I think it was, like I say, fascinating. And it's actually, I know, I know a fair amount about this topic and I, I learned a lot. Um, please stay tuned for future programs and um, uh, check your email and we'll be letting you know of upcoming, uh, upcoming professional development programs. So again, thank you, Professor Sinkoff and everybody have a great afternoon. You too. Thank you, everyone.